in the summer of 2011. The Hofstra University School of Medicine, in partnership with the North Shore LIJ Health System, is proud to host this two-year-long lecture series entitled The Complete Physician, Educating Tomorrow's Caregivers. Each lecture of the series will examine one of our core values through the eyes of a guest scholar, public policymaker, or advocate. The inaugural lecture is truly timely as we have just submitted the self-study and database in preparation for the anticipated site visit in March by the LCME and preliminary accreditation by the LCME and State of New York this coming June. Our mission statement reads as follows. The School of Medicine, in a culture of community, scholarship, and innovation, is dedicated to inspiring diverse and promising students to lead and transform medicine for the betterment of humanity. Our values, which will guide and shape the development and culture of our school, are community, diversity, scholarship, professionalism, innovation, patient-centered learning, reflection, humanism, and vision. We host this public series in order to build, and su build support and understanding of our vision of a new kind of medical education, the creation of a collaborative culture between Hofstra University scholars and North Shore LIJ's medical professionals, educate our community and colleagues both at a local, national, and uh, regional um, geographic area about our mission and our values. And we'd like to engage in a discussion, which we hope we will do today, about these core values. So we open the series with the value of scholarship. And I'll read what our scholarship value uh, reads. We embrace a culture of broadly defined scholarship and excellence supported by academic recognition of and investment in our faculty and students. We will establish and nurture this culture by aligning the goals of our school with those of our faculty and students. The students will learn how to inextricably link their scholarly work with their success as physicians. So we're very pleased to have two distinguished scholars here today, Dr. Stephen Cantor and Dr. Danielle Ofri. And so we're going to have each of our guests give a presentation of about 15 minutes, followed by some type of interactive uh, prompted discussion, perhaps moderated and led by me if you don't come up with questions, but I'm hoping everyone in the audience will certainly ask our scholars some questions. So I'm going to first introduce Dr. Cantor. Dr. Cantor is the Vice Dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where he's been a faculty member since 1991, and he's currently the editor and chief of Academic Medicine, the peer-reviewed journal of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Dr. Cantor draws from a diverse background experience that includes that in clinical medicine, he's a trained neurosurgeon, medical informatics, medical education, and distinguished medical school administration. In 1992, Dr. Cantor was recruited to develop the Office of Medical Education at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He served as the founding director of that office and subsequently was appointed the Associate Dean of Medical Education, during which time he was a key part of the team that guided the implementation of the new medical school curriculum. Dr. Cantor's work has been recognized with multiple awards and honors, including the Student National Medical Association Black Bag Award, a University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine Excellence in Education Award, and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine Distinguished Service Award in Medical Education, the highest honor in medical education bestowed by the school. Recently, his research on defining the correctness of diagnosis won the Patil Award, which is the, for the best research presentation at the, ninth, at the 2007 meeting of the Association of uh, medical education in Europe. He's a member of a number of local, regional, and national committees and task forces. He served on the editorial boards of academic medicine and medical teacher. He remains an active participant in teaching, both locally and nationally, receiving high marks, high marks from students and praise from colleagues. Each month, we all look forward to opening academic medicine and quickly starting with his thought-provoking, insightful, and on-point editorials where he challenges our academic community on a broad range of issues, from establishing the threshold for the correct diagnosis, through how pre-med curriculum of the future should be structured, and how to win an argument, which we've all been recently engaged in, on about the fourth year of medical school curriculum, and lastly, all the way to how the academic community can and should contribute to world peace. So on many forefronts, he has really changed, to my mind, the culture of academic medicine certainly at least the journal. So um, with that, I'd ask you to please welcome Dr. Stephen Cantor.
Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for that very, very nice uh, introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here to help all of you celebrate the beginning of a new medical school. Uh, I think it uh, says so much about all of you uh, as university and health system leaders, as physicians and scientists, uh, and as community members that you have chosen to devote your energy, your intelligence, your talent uh, to educating future physicians. Uh, and I'm also excited about your desire to engage in a community-wide discussion of key values. Uh, these values will provide a strong foundation for building a strong school. Now, uh, I am from Pittsburgh, uh, but um, uh, I should disclose to you that I was born uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, I left at the age of six. I mean, you know, my parents moved. I followed my parents. I didn't uh, just strike out. But as a New Yorker, I, I'm enough of a New Yorker that I realize that uh, New Yorkers uh, see New York as comprising 99% of the Earth's surface and the rest of the world as comprising the other 1%. So I thought that I should start by uh, telling you a little bit about where uh, Pittsburgh is. And so this is the United States, and we'll zoom in on the northeast portion, and you can see that uh, the state of Pennsylvania uh, is uh, south of the state of New York and east of New York City. Uh, Philadelphia is a city which many New Yorkers are familiar with, and I just want to point out that that is not Pittsburgh, that Pennsylvania is about 350 miles wide, and Pittsburgh is on the western side of the state. Uh, so I'm going to zoom down a little bit. Uh, Pittsburgh sits at the confluence of three rivers. Anybody want to name the three rivers? Is that, I'm not supposed to give, it's Dave, the moderator's job to give the quiz, I guess, but, um, well, Allegheny's good. That's one of the rivers. Well, there I, I heard Monongahela, that's the southern river. Allegheny is the north. The Ohio is the one on the left. So that's it. You guys are pretty good. You got, I heard all of them somewhere in there. If we just uh, zoom down a little further at what they call the point, where those three rivers come together, this is what it looks like. That's downtown Pittsburgh. And if you fly one mile into the picture and turn around, uh, it looks like this. You can see downtown in the distance. And in the foreground is the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. All right, so what I'd like to do is um, just see if we can ask and answer three questions. Uh, one, why is scholarship an important value for a medical school? Two, have medical schools used scholarship effectively to advance their missions? And I thought we'd look briefly at each of the three core missions. And the third question we'll come to in a minute. And I see the, it didn't quite translate into one, two, and three, but all right. Um, so why is scholarship an important value for a medical school? Well, you know, scholarship provides a solid platform on which you can advance the school's missions. And it, it can be used to recognize and reward individual faculty accomplishment to help de uh, develop a framework for faculty career progression, which we'll come back to a very important uh, point that we don't often think about, uh, can help build a curriculum for students based on problem solving, critical thinking, and the value of evidence, uh, and certainly can foster a culture of personal growth and discovery. So no question, and I certainly don't have to convince this group that uh, scholarship is an important foundational value. So let's ask, have medical schools used scholarship effectively to advance their missions? If we ask the question first for research, um, you know, since World War II especially, medical schools have advanced the research mission by promoting faculty primarily based on the evaluation of scholarship. And, and this has been highly successful. It's catalyzed high quality biomedical research throughout this country. And I would uh, rate that, uh, that medical schools have been very effective at using scholarship and faculty promotion based on scholarship to advance uh, the research mission of medical schools. If we ask the same question uh, about education, 
Uh, I would say that medical schools have been less effective in using the value of scholarship in a systematic and directed way to advance a school's educational mission. So let's, let's rate that less effective, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And let's ask the same question for uh, patient care or the clinical mission. Uh, generally, a school, medical school's promotion processes are organized to promote faculty based on scholarly accomplishment, not based on service, and at most medical schools, patient care is regarded as service. Service is deemed necessary, but not sufficient for promotion. So I'm going to rate this an ongoing challenge. Um, so let's, let's ask a third question now. Uh, how can scholarship be used more effectively to advance the education and patient care missions? Well, let's, let's take a look at how scholarship has been used to advance the research mission. Uh, you see on the left side uh, typical characteristics of scholarly work. If you read definitions of scholarship, they talk about excellence, uh, originality of the work, creativity, innovative work, things that have not been done previously. Uh, work that has an influence on a field that advances thinking or practice in a field. Um, and, and the way we see evidence of that scholarly work is in the form of peer-reviewed grant, uh, competitive grant funding, publications in peer-reviewed journals, national and international reputation, and certain prestigious honors and awards. Um, and although uh, faculty promotion committees often get very focused on what you see on the right side of the screen. Ultimately, the real discussion should be about what's on the left side of the screen. So if we think for a minute, um, what would this look like if we thought uh, about it in relation to promoting the educational mission of the school? A number of people have talked about uh, broadening definitions of scholarship and modifying the characteristics that we think about I think that these characteristics of scholarly work are critical. They've, been, uh, they've helped us be very successful with the research mission, and I think these same characteristics can help us be successful with the education mission. So what it might look like uh, if you wanted to see evidence of scholarly work in education, and we've been working with a system like this in Pittsburgh for a number of years now, uh, there should be a record of individual accomplishment in teaching, but also a record of program level responsibilities and contributions and documented excellence in both of those things. Uh, certainly publications in peer-reviewed education journals is a plus. You see it sometimes, but not always for a variety of reasons we can talk about. Um, are there innovative contributions? You can ask the question, how is this school different because of this individual's uh, scholarly work, this individual's presence there, uh, educational activities and programs. Um, okay. And last, if we ask the same question about uh, clinical work, uh, it's a little tougher, uh, and, and medical schools struggle with this issue. We've been experimenting uh, over the last couple of years with something that has come to be called the impact report. Maybe there's a better uh, name for it. Where individuals who wish to be promoted on the basis of mainly of clinical contributions, that doesn't mean they don't teach a little or they don't do other kinds of, of activities, but if they want to be promoted mainly on the basis of accomplishments in clinical work, uh, we've been asking these individuals to prepare a report which describes their accomplishments in the context of specific projects and to describe both quantitative and, and qualitatively what uh, the accomplishments were. Uh, we also listed those six items at the bottom which uh, you may recognize as being GLASIC's uh, six criteria for scholarship. Um, and, and we ask the individual to prepare a report, and it starts to frame clinical work in a more scholarly uh, way. So um, let me leave you with um, the, just a few thoughts. One, it takes a diverse group of individuals with a broad range of talents to make a successful medical school. If requirements for scholarship are too narrow, faculty promotion criteria will be too rigid, 
and you will restrict the breadth of talent you need to achieve excellence across all missions of the school. If requirements for scholarship are too broad, faculty promotion criteria will be vague and you will not be able to achieve the quality you seek. If requirements are just right, um, and as a new medical school, you have the opportunity to get them just right without the uh, uh, baggage of tradition. Uh, but if they're just right for this school at this time in its history, of course, you'll have the foundation you need to advance research, education, and patient care. Uh, let me stop there and um, and I'll say congratulations to all of you on, um, on being involved in the formation of a new school and uh, certainly best wishes uh, for the years ahead. Thanks. So what we're going to do now is move to uh, hear from our second speaker, and I'd like to introduce her. This is Dr. Danielle Ofri, a native of New York City. Uh, she is a physician and teacher at Bellevue Hospital, which is the oldest public hospital in the United States. As a writer and literary editor, Dr. Ofri speaks with a unique insight into the practice of medicine and co-founded and is editor-in-chief of the first literary journal published by a hospital, the Bellevue Literary Journal. The journal publishes essays, fiction, and poetry that celebrate patients as people and medicine as the art of healing the whole person. Dr. Ofri has also edited the best of the Bellevue Literary Review, released last February, is the author of two literary works of her own, which you can see in the back, uh, Singular Intimacies and Incidental Findings, and a third book due in January. I guess that book's not here yet. You have a copy, <laughs> an advanced copy, uh, Medicine and Translation, which focuses on the experience of Dr. Ofri's immigrant patients at the Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Ofri studied physiology as an undergrad at McGill University in Montreal, where she also earned her PhD in biochemistry. Spent the next decade at NYU and Bellevue Medical Center um, for her further medical and scientific education. As an attending physician at Bellevue, she divides her time between seeing patients, teaching medical students, residents, editing, writing, and I guess I recently learned running the Coumadin Clinic. That's not easy. Um, in her practice at Bellevue Medical Clinic, the home of the most extraordinary human, uh, human stories throughout its long history in the nation's most diverse and complex city, Dr. Offrey has focused on reaching the real humanity of her patients and on teaching young doctors how to do the same. She has a particular interest in the relationship of literature and medicine, has introduced a program encouraging medical students to experiment with literary descriptions of patient encounters to help explore the complexities of illness. Her essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, The Los Angeles Times, and a national public radio. She's won a number of prizes across the country, and she gives lectures to medical and non-medical audiences on a wide range of topics. She also gives her readings from her books and offers on-site workshops designed to unleash creativity even in those without any writing experience. And I will tell you that uh, she is in demand. Um, I was able to look through her website and over the next six months, she is scheduled for over 30 appearances around the country. So I'm not really sure how you do that and run the Kumanin Clinic. But uh, and anyway, we'd like to hear a little bit from you today about scholarship and, and your work and how that would actually contribute, uh, in essence, to our medical school. I have never been having trouble hearing. How's that? So every medical school I've been to has already been there when I got there. So this is really a, a new thing. And um, you know, having having a birth is an amazing experience. I think the people who are medical students, physicians, can all remember when they delivered a baby, what that experience was. Um, actually, having a new book is a little bit like having a baby when it arrived in the mail just last week. It was uh, quite, uh, quite exciting. And I um, agree with Dr. Cantor that New York is indeed the center of the world. A and I couldn't imagine being in any place else. And I want to talk today a little bit about how I got to the career spot that I am, which was not at all planned. And that in itself is something that I try to emphasize with my audiences, that sometimes we start out in our medical training and our lives with very distinct plans of how we wish to be scholars and physicians. 
And sometimes those plans go awry in, in very creative and unexpected ways. And opening ourselves up to some spontaneity in life can, can do a lot. I started out on the straight and narrow path. I did an MD-PhD program at NYU. Um, my PhD was in biochemistry. In the still, how's that? I'm just hold this. So I was kind of in line to do uh, straight bench research, which is what I did. My PhD advisor Eric Simon is a, an organic chemist by training, and uh, our lab was biochemistry. And I loved being in the lab, and I thought it was the most wonderful, free kid in a candy store intellectual environment to be in. Then I started an internship with the goal of being a neurologist. But as an intern at Bellevue, I fell in love with clinical care and decided to stay in internal medicine. And again, we were all um, focused on hello, focused on research, becoming a chief resident, doing a fellowship. And then in the autumn of my internship year, one of my closest childhood friends had a sudden cardiac arrest at age 27 of IHSS, well, congenital cardiac disease, and, and died. And to me, that was the event that stopped me in my tracks and had me reevaluate where I was going. And in an unbelievable random set of occurrences, last night, his younger sister was admitted to Bellevue with chest pain. And so I spent this morning being in the ER with her. Um, guys, useless. Um, and Hello? So this is why I have little faith in technology. So having a personal event that changed my uh, direction was not something, again, I would have planned for or obviously ever have hoped for, but it made me think where I was going and why I was rushing so fast. I had been on the academic track since I was five years old and had never taken any time off. So um, when I finished residency, instead of doing a chief residency or a fellowship like most of my colleagues, I took off about close to two years to travel. And I did some locum tenens, which is temporary work in various places in the country to pay off my student loans. And in between the uh, jobs, I traveled to South America for as long as the money would last. And then I would call, collect, and look for a job um, you know, next Tuesday. This is something that was not looked upon very um, finely by my advisors, who 201 advised me against this. They all said, you'll lose your clinical skills. You'll forget medicine. You won't be able to get back into academic medicine. Um, you know, it's, it's a terrible way to, you know, squander your education after all these years. But I'd had, you know, just about up to here with death, dying, disease, and hospitals, and I needed to get out. And luckily, a very wise non-medical person said to me, you know, I think they're jealous. And with that bit of wisdom, I took off. I canceled my New England Journal of Medicine subscription, stocked up on novels, bought a laptop, and it was the first time in, for me, 10 years of medical school, residency, and PhD that I had a chance to stop and think and contemplate. And there's not a lot of room for reflection in the process of medical training. It's very intense. It's very fast. Um, I looked upon with envy one of my residency colleagues who took notes while we were training. And I wished I could do the same because I was cognizant that so much was happening, things I would never see again, people I would never meet, and I should write them down. And in a sense, I was uh, journaling this, but only in the sense of platelet counts and spleen sizes in the, in the chart. And part of this, I think, was maybe it was a little too emotionally close to the bone at the moment. Uh, part of it was sheer laziness. But when I took this time off to be away from medicine, I realized that I, I wanted to write down these stories. These were soul-searing stories that would never happen again that I might never be privileged to be in that experience again. I wasn't planning to be a writer. Again, I was a scientist by training. I wasn't planning to write a book, but I just needed to write. And I realized as I was writing that the, the fact that writing is a slow and contemplative process allows one to think and reflect in a way that the experience doesn't. And writing and revising, and I discovered that I'm a rabid reviser and I've probably deforest, you know, the state of Maine each time I try to write a book, I'm like the 90th revision. But each time I rewrite, I, I go through this uh, process again of experience what happened. Um, my book, Singular Intimacies, which chronicles actually the death of my friend Josh and, and that experience, was just reissued. And so after many, many years of not looking at it, I actually reread that chapter. And what's amazing is how one can be transported back into that emotional moment many years later, even though I've read the words so many times. 
And so after those travels, I, um, I was broke, I still had student loans, so I wanted a job, and I realized I wanted to be back at Bellevue. I had a chance in locum tenens to work in private practice, in a Catholic medical center, in a rural Indian medical center, um, a community hospital, and I realized that I wanted to be at Bellevue. I couldn't imagine a place more alive and also filled with such an um, intellectual camaraderie. The people who choose to be at Bellevue and stay there are an unusual set of people who really commit themselves to a place that has its challenges and there's easier places to work at Bellevue, but um, some people find their calling there and it's a really wonderful group to be with. So I came back and as it happens, then as there is now, there's a fiscal crisis and a hiring freeze and so in serendipity uh, caused her to be a hiring freeze and no new jobs. When the freeze finally unfroze, there's only a three day week position, part time. I never even crossed my mind to be a part-time doctor. I never would have planned it, but that's what there was. I had bills, and so I took it. And so I worked three days a week in the clinic, and suddenly I had these two extra days. And so I began to work on these stories that I've been writing. I took a writing class and began honing them, and I realized that this was part of um, medicine that was giving me a whole new perspective. And then a full-time spot opened up and I was offered the full-time spot. And in fact, my salary would have doubled because as you may or may not know, part-time people are, tend to be prorated fairly shabbily. And I was, what would I do if I suddenly had twice the amount of money yeah, in life? I still couldn't afford an apartment in Manhattan. I don't own a car. I have clothing. And I realized the one thing I'd want to buy with money is the one thing I couldn't buy. And that would be time time to pursue what gives me meaning, and so I feel like I bought that time by turning down a full-time offer. And to this day, I continue to work three days a week in the clinic and keep the other two days for writing and, and now editing. But when I came back, I realized that I, I wanted to bring some part of this writing to my students. And at that time, um, Marty Blazer was our new chairman of medicine, and he had asked the students to start writing an essay in the third year clerkship, which of course was revolutionary at the time, write an essay, 1,000 words. And I was working with the students in the clinic, and they hand in those HMPs, those uh, patient write-ups. And if you've graded a few of these, by the time you've reached the seventh of them, they're pretty dull to read. And by the time you reach 500 of them, they're intoxicatingly dull. And so I asked my students, for one of them, instead of writing the HPI and the PMH and the review of systems, just tell the patient's story. Just tell what it's like for that patient to experience their illness. What it was like when they were told about it. What is it like to live with that? And I began to accumulate a huge collection of just fascinating insights into the patient experience. And so someone uh, suggested that Marty and I sit down and talk since we were both having our students write essays. And we thought about perhaps um, making a student literary journal. And that's when we came with the idea that there's actually um, probably a larger interest in the experience experiential aspect of being a patient and, and being a doctor. And that's when we started the Bellevue Literary Review. I had some copies, but I left them upstairs. N normally, when you do grand rounds, um, you know, you can't have, you have to reveal any financial connections. You can't promote anything commercial. But since literary journals don't ever make any money, I can't say it's a competing financial interest. So I encourage you all to check out the Bellevue Literary Review. And I brought some subscription forms in the back. And we took out three, um, three line ads calling for submissions in some small writing journals. A thousand submissions hit our offices within two, three months. And we were unprepared for the onslaught of it, uh, submissions. I and mean, these were from people from all walks of life. Writers, patients, doctors, social workers, lawyers. And it said to us that there is such a large need to speak about medicine and our bodies, the vulnerability which we face, because we're all there or, or we'll all be there. And there's a lot of um, concern, there's a lot of fear, and um, that fiction and poetry and nonfiction, literary nonfiction, is a way to examine that critical part of medicine that is different than what's in the journal. <clears throat> and just going back to New York being the center of the world, if you read The New Yorker, I will say that the BLR is in this week's issue of The New Yorker um, for one of our uh, poetry readings. And as this went along, it became a larger and larger uh, part of my life, editing and seeing, and, and along with seeing patients, teaching on the inpatient wards. And I began to start distributing poetry on rounds. And I thought, you know, after we finish presenting the cases, you know, let's just do a quick, quick poem of the day. And it's an interesting thing how um, 
students look at this. Some people think it's a wonderful change of pace, some people think you're off the planet Mars. But the reason that I'm, uh, I try to, to, to read poetry, it's short, but the idea of metaphor is so critical in our thinking. When patients come to us with aches and pains and vague symptoms, we may write them off as chronic complainers or Hispanic hysterical syndrome or frequent flyers, total body dolor, but they're really speaking to us in metaphor and learning how to interpret our patient's metaphor. Metaphors is a skill that's critical for doctors that we need to develop. And sometimes I watch our house staff present a case and they're such concrete thinkers, it, it's kind of like the, the clerk at the bagel store, you know, two sesame, two poppy, some locks, very straightforward. And I, I fear that they're going to miss the point sometimes. Maybe the patient doesn't come in a straightforward way. And looking at how creative people think, artists, writers, musicians, they use parts of their brains in a very nonlinear fashion. And I think that we could stand to learn from that. And poetry is one way of, um, of helping students and house staff think in more creative fashion and not let their brains ossify in, in simple ways. I don't want to go on too long. The, the last thing I wanted to mention um, in the idea of narrative medicine is the tradition of, um, of uh, epistolary writing, letter writing. And sometimes we look, we, people publish letters because letters tell us a lot about people's lives. And I had an experience um, in the uh, ICU once that was one of those just a war stories kind of day. When I got home, the first thing I did is I wrote a letter, an email to a friend. You, you won't believe what happened to me today. And I just told the whole story because I needed to, I need to tell someone, even though she wasn't necessarily going to hear at that moment. But the act of writing this letter, of telling the story was a way to pull um, the events together in some way that could be tangible. You know, when I came out of the experience, it was, felt very fragmented. And until I could write it down, it didn't yet have a coherent whole. So it became the, um, the prologue to my book, Singular Intimacies. And it's a, it's a short part, and I'll just read um, two pages. It's called Possessing Her Words. Air France, she says, no other airline. My body must fly to Paris via Air France. Air France, I write as quickly as I can. And they must first go to City Hall to verify the Bernot family name. Her voice warbles through the oxygen mask, direct and dignified, if a bit staccato from her breathlessness. The anesthesiologist hovering over Adrian Bernot with the endotracheal tube and ventilator, gasping at a rate of 35 breaths per minute, with her wispy neck muscles straining like reeds in a summer storm, there isn't much time. No ceremony before the interment, she continues in her bird-like voice, just a burial at Rue de la Colonnade. I dutifully transcribe her words as the resident physician silences the insistent alarm on the overhead monitors. The anesthesiologist loads his syringe with succinylcholine. Adrienne Bernot doesn't look 62 years old. She has that mythical, ageless beauty that French women seem to possess, her innate charm deceptively triumphant over her stage 3B lung cancer. Please give my paintings to Pierre Montagnier, she says, adjusting the headband that holds her reddish black hair in place. And the linens to my neighbor, Sarah Pelnick, if she would like them. And you, she says, looking over her oxygen mask at the intern, who is drawing yet another tube of blood. It is time for you to start paying me for all that blood I'm giving you. The anesthesiologist draws up 10 cc's of fentanyl. With no way to be unobtrusive in this crowded and cramped room, the medical student shrinks himself further inside his white lab coat. I read aloud the words I have transcribed, and she is satisfied. With delicate, long-nailed fingers from which many an elegant cigarette has dangled, she signs her name in trembling letters. I add mine as the attending physician directly below. The clerk from accounts payable stamps her notary in brusque black ink next to our signatures. She looks directly at me. Seven days, she says, swallowing air in quick bites. Un semaine. Seven days of intubation and treatment is all Adrian Berno wants. If I do not get better, she puffs, take it out. Seven days to figure out whether the spidery lattice work that has progressed so rapidly in her chest x-ray is an infection or if it is a suffocating return of her cancer. In seven days, we'd have a reasonable chance of getting an infection under control. But if the biopsy confirms cancer, the seventh day will likely be her last. We stand in a silent semicircle around her bed, and she glances at each of us. What are you all so nervous about, mes amis? We go forward, no? The anesthesiologist flexes the laryngoscope in the air to check that it's functioning properly, and it snaps open with a decisive metallic click. I hold her hand and ask if she has any further questions. She shakes her head no. On rounds last week, 
I distributed an article from the Annals of Internal Medicine entitled The Good Death. It talked about how terminally ill patients express a consistent desire to give back to society, and so I take a deep breath. We train young doctors here, I say, nodding to the medical student, resident, and intern, gathered around the bedside in their crisp white coats, with pockets bulging from medical paraphernalia. Is there anything you'd like to share with us that would help us all become better doctors? She looks around the room, her finely honed cheeks puffing inside the mask. No, I have no complaints. You've all been my guardian angels. Heavy swallows and four gazes plummet to the ground. Is there anything else we can get you, I ask? A clean gown, see will play. I've made a mess of this one. Four sighs, a request we can actually fulfill. The respiratory monitor clangs again to warn of dropping oxygen saturation, and four arms rush to silence it. And you promise me, she says, that I sleep through the whole thing, that I do not wake up for the whole week. I nod, hoping that her low blood pressure won't preclude the use of strong sedatives. The anesthesiologist raises his eyes to the overhead monitor and then looks to me, parallel lines of wrinkles tensing on his forehead. Three loaded syringes are curled in one hand and the plastic endotracheal tube is clasped in the other. Are you ready? I ask, still holding her hand. We, oui, she says. Her eyes dart over the edge of the mask, locking us in a tight airless circle. See you later, I say, in the breezy tone I might use with a friend parting ways on the street, and then silently demand to God that we'd better uncover garden variety microorganisms in her lungs and not malignant cells. We'll see you at the other end, I add, hoping that I am not lying. I nod to the anesthesiologist as he discharges the first syringe. Adrian Bernot's sculpted lips with her carefully applied lipstick soften as the sedative whispers into her veins. Then her fingers suddenly tighten around mine in a vice-like grip, her nails digging to my palm. I know that it's just the depolarizing effects of the succinyl choline on her muscles, but it feels like a panicked plea for life, and I want to shout, no, don't do it. I want to grab the endotracheal tube from the anesthesiologist's hand to block what may be the beginning of the end. I want to lay my body across hers and protest the silencing of her words. I want to keep her voice with us in this moment, in this room, in this world. But I know that it can't hold out. Her flailing respiratory muscles and besotted lungs can no longer support this voice that is so much the embodiment of Adrian Bernot. It will disappear with or without our mechanical intervention. Seven days on the machine is our only chance. The anesthesiologist lowers the head of the bed and slides the tube down her throat. Her lipstick is smeared in the process. The machine takes over, and all at once, Adrian Bernot's body is limp and sallow like every other body lying in wait in the ICU. One by one, I unlock her tensed fingers from mine. The blunt silence is punctuated only by the heaving of the ventilator. Four pairs of eyes catch each other, then shudder away in disparate directions. There is the sudden, icy awareness that we might be the possessors of Adrian Bernot's final words. We might be the guardians of her last smile, her final joke, her ultimate bon mot. We file out from the room, medical student, intern, resident, and attending our hands dangling awkward and useless, our tears threatening to give way. Like an invisible chain, the silent prayer snakes from one to the next, that maybe Adrian Bernot will indeed speak again, and that we will not be required to carry this burden to our final days. Seven days we wait, seven days we hold her words. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, well, I think as a new, uh, well, first, as a new medical school, I, I think that the simple answer is it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, but as a new medical school, I think you have a, an opportunity to, uh, to interpret Boyer's uh, four uh, categories of scholarship in such a way that it helps you advance the kinds of things you want to do. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly all these concepts have been used very effectively to advance the research mission, and I think uh, a, a, an interesting approach is to try to build on that um, uh, and, and use it. And, and uh, like I uh, showed with that one slide, um, I'm not sure we have to run from the, uh, the, the traditional values of scholarship. I think they can be applied in interesting ways to both education and patient care. How can we help uh, both with not just our new school in terms of forming and promoting the rewards as, as is also expressed in our, in our value um, to our faculty and students along these lines of scholarship but also nationally because uh, whatever we do here is, is terrific but um, you know, I guess my question also is how well are we really doing at, at the other institutions um, and how, how does your journal, I would say, then and help promote that? Uh, so you're, you're asking um, how do you uh, make known what you do here? Um, well, not or? just how we make known what we do here, but how can we ensure that we will, in fact, reward, uh, and not just here, here in other places? Because I, I think I see that influence in, in the journal since you took over as editor, mm -hmm. seeing a, a broader representation of scholarship published in the journal. So to, to me, I guess I'm inferring that that's that uh, w was thoughtful and, and on purpose. Y yes, it was. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, um, yes, I, I think um, that uh, in, in terms of uh, looking at what you do, um, a, a typical approach, so, so when you do new things and innovative things and uh, new projects, new curriculum, um, it, you put a lot of effort into it. People put their blood, sweat, and tears into it. And, and they want to describe it for the same reason Danielle uh, wants to describe the things that uh, she sees. But a program description is um, alone is, um, only has so much value in terms of uh, what other institutions can do with it. And, and so, uh, you know, editors struggle with this because we get a lot of submissions of, of program descriptions and I um, had the Academic Medicine Editorial Board spend a half day uh, thinking about this issue and, and specifically focusing on how do you describe innovations in a way that might be useful to other institutions. Um, and a number of things came out of that. but. A lot of times the solutions we come up with are not generalizable. It's the problem itself that's uh, generalizable. And looking at describing the problem and, and how you approached it and what some of the uh, different issues were can be useful. So, so um, developing a description in that way can be useful uh, more broadly. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but. Well, I guess uh, you are, though, tackling uh, through the work in your journal and the, and the decisions that you and the rest of the editorial board make about what to publish, um, adding credibility to a variety of scholarly work beyond just pure sure. new discovery. Y yes, sure. And, and um, it, qualitative studies are a, uh, an example. A uh, number of journals in the past wouldn't entertain qualitative studies. But our approach has been to look for uh, high quality work um, regardless of what area it's in. Sam, you want to come up to the microphone?
Uh, that Bellevue has been doing this longer than other people. And the issue that comes up, certainly in putting an application through the LCME, is the assessment that you're going to do. What outcome do you want? So my, it's a simple question. Now that you've done this for such a long time as part of your life, is there something at NYU and the School of Medicine that deals with the assessment of these writings by students? Well, here, here's the thing that I, um I sometimes chafe at this whole idea of, of assessment and outcomes. Does everything have to have a quantifiable outcome? Because the truth is some things are not quantifiable. And I appreciated in Dr. Cantor's lecture the challenges of how do you promote those who are clinicians, who are, the idea that clinical service is so low on the totem pole, to me is despicable. I mean, this is, this is the, our raison d'etre, right? To take care of patients. And the fact that, that doesn't seem to count at all in general for advancing our, our, our academics seems like a, um, seems very hypocritical. So, but it's very hard to judge how we, how well we take care of our patients. And I get an A1C report and I, you know, every quarter and I get some thing, Dr. Ofer, you haven't done medication reconciliation, Dr. Ofer, you haven't done enough domestic violence screening, whatever the screening thing du jour is. And, and I, I appreciate that they're trying to do this, but this is not the way it works. I don't think that we're going to measure that for individual physicians. We were just told we're now going to be given mortality rates for individual physicians. And I finally raised my hand and said, are you crazy? They said, well, it's important to know. And I said, you know, I, it may actually not be because the idea of more data being better, there's such variability for individual months on the wards that it, I think it can actually do, do harm. So I'm assessing things that don't, aren't amenable to the same type of outcome assessment I think can be damaging. And mortality data on an institutional level or a national level has meaning. For an individual doctor, aside from the huge outliers, probably doesn't. It probably varies with flu season or, or something else. And the same with narrative medicine. I don't think we're going to be able to measure outcomes in compassion, empathy, patients who respect their doctors. They're not measurable things. And so trying to apply this model I think isn't going to work. At some point we say, this is a value that's important. Training our physicians to be compassionate, to be creative, just is important. And we're going to have to bite the bullet and say, it's a value. And I believe that it comes from uh, walking the walk. So when the chair of the department says, there's going to be room for literature in, in our curriculum, or the dean says, we're actually going to have ethics within the curriculum officially, there's going to be an hour, a week, or what have you, then, then it's there. If it's given lip service but not actual time or value, then the students realize this is just, you know, a patina. But I, I think that it's not going to work with outcomes. And uh, I have all the respect for Rita Sharon. I think she's probably the only person who probably can show outcomes, but it's very hard because these are not measurable things. I think we can just say this value is important, period. You know, if I could, uh, can I add That's something to that? Um, the, I think that um, medical educators run hard towards outcomes because, uh, medical faculty, because um, we're charged with warranting the competence of our students. And, and, you know, we decide whether they get an MD degree or not at the end of four years. And you have to make that decision based on some good, solid information, and, and you have to be right about it. Um, and it, most people sleep better if they can count it because then they can say, oh, well, this popped over a 10, so therefore I decided it was okay. Uh, but the kinds of things that you're, you're saying are important that um, in, in warranting the competence of, of someone to be able to receive the MD degree, there are things that we have to make decisions on that are not measurable and are hard. That's, um, so I, I don't have a great answer for it, but that's, that's the problem. <laughs> I think we had somebody want to come up to the mic. Can you hear me? Um, I just want to direct this to Dr. Offrey. I'm a Bellevue boy. I uh, was in Bellevue in the 60s. And that um, I had experienced what you had experienced. And um, 
I've been practicing pediatrician in Babylon for the past, uh, since 1974. And how can you, I graduated from Hofstra University in 1998. How can you combine in these days in age of the HMOs, how can you combine an effective compassion, communication in the days and age of HMOs, wherein you have to deal with bottom lines and the medical students graduating with $40,000 a year in debt, how can you effectively combine the two? Well, it's certainly a challenging question. And I look at our, our daily clinical life has clearly worsened. I mean, I can see it over the years as more, we, we have electronic medical records, so they can easily add on more mandates by making a required field. You can't, you can't close the visit until you uh, check off whatever the new box is. And they keep increasing them. Now it's, there must be 20 screening things to do, all of which have value, but they, and you're, not, you're not given any more time with the patient. So we'll, we'll never make that contradiction work. We're always going to have worse and worse um, structural aspects. The issue of compassion, compassion is an internal one. And how we protect our compassion from being eaten away by these external factors is our own sort of strength of soul. And part of that is in our role model. So when I talk about walking the walk, it's also when the students are trained that they see their attending or their chief resident acting in a compassionate and moral way and, and pointing that out and taking, taking the time. And it may only require a few extra minutes, not an extra hour, even though if we would like that. But um, demonstrating that this, this is a, a value and, and, I th <clears throat> and showing it. Sometimes there are small strategies, simple things uh, when students ask about that is I tell them, you know, spend the first three minutes of your visit not writing, looking at the patient. It may sound like a very small amount, but three minutes is a very long time to maintain full eye contact. And that can often just be enough to have the patient feel your compassion. And then you can check, go and check your 20,000 boxes in the computer. It's not easy, but it comes from being demonstrated by those higher up. And then if our uh, chairs then promote the people who are, who are practicing, not just the ones who are, you know, publishing basic science research saying this is a value for promotion, tenure, um, giving them, uh, you know, resources, then that will, I think, give that message. Hi, I'm Carol Barnett. I teach Spanish here, and I've created a course in medical Spanish, so I teach medical students, and it's become the highlight of a long career. And one of the questions I have for Dr. Ofri is, how do you impart the humanity part in the curriculum that is so um, packed? Um, you know, the stereotype of the doctor was, he's a great doctor, but he has no bedside manner. Um, He's had all these science courses and he has very, very few humanities. One of the things I tell my medical students is the same thing, the eye contact. It doesn't matter if you don't speak the same language, but we all share humanity. And I don't think they get that in their regular curriculum. Well, I think you can't do it in a classroom setting. I mean, I see that this is being taught in the clinical setting, when you're one-on-one -on -one with your supervisors, with your patients. And, and again, dem seeing the leader demonstrate that. So an example, most of our patients are indeed Spanish speaking, and probably most of my day is conducted in Spanish. And I've always had this fantasy of sharing poetry with our patients too, as I do with my interns. But I can't, most of them speak Spanish or Bengali. But there's one population at Bellevue that uniformly speak English, and those are the alcoholics. <laughs> They're almost all white Caucasian Americans who have some, who have been in society and had some kind of downfall. So all the alcohol withdrawal patients, and there are many, by and large, speak English. So one day, and the teams, you know, pretty much hate these patients, right? They're annoying, they smell, they're homeless, they need, you know, disposition issues, they just need their Valium or Librium, they just want to kind of get rid of them. So I said, let's, let's give this a whirl. And I took the poem by Jack Coulihan, who was a Long Islander from Stony Brook, just retired. He's a poet and family physician. He has a poem called, I'm Gonna Slap Those Doctors. And it's the perspective of an alcoholic looking at a white-coated, crossed-armed doctor and just wanting to slug the crap out of that guy for his arrogant manner. So I took the team and we read the poem to the patient. The patient loved it. He was just so excited by that poem. And after that, he became this real person. He wasn't just oh, the, the alcohol withdrawal guy because we have so many of them, but people remembered his name and who he was. And that's one example. The other thing 
I try to do, and I do this, I gave a lecture yesterday to the third year medical students. Before we start, I went around the room and asked, what's your name, where are you from, what's the most recent book you've read? Blank, the year and headlines look. And then what's your hobby and passion? And most say, well, I used to, and they would fill in the blank with 10 things I used to do. Um, so I've started asking that of our patients. And again, to take the, um, one of the things I do when I start the month in the wars, ask them for who is the most difficult, annoying, obnoxious patient on your service. Let's go talk to them. And ask that smelly, homeless, drug addict person, what's your hobby or passion? And you'd be amazed that these fairly despicable patients um, have had real passions and hobbies. And one guy, it was Civil War history. And we had no expectation he would have an esoteric passion, but suddenly he became this human being. It didn't take very long. It also made, and it just made our day more interesting. A patient became a real human being. It was done a lot of work, but it has to be demonstrated by the attending in a white coat. You know, they used to try and like put in a social worker to give us touchy-feely rounds, and it never worked because they didn't have the clinical credibility with the house staff. But when you're attending, your chief of service or your chairman comes in and demonstrates that in those few minutes, it says this is of value, and I think that's the only way to do it. Well, I think you're fantastic. You're an inspiration. Thank you. <laughs> you get me a raise, okay? <laughs> So this is a little bit of a challenge because I think everything you're saying is great and how to get the medical students to value it is through role modeling from other clinicians and I, I think that's very true. So in terms of academic medicine though, how to cross this with academic medicine? Like if physicians, you, you're able to write a book, you know, the books that you have and you have a great gift that you can write a book. But many people have these stories and these inspirations within themselves and they can't write a book. But the idea of having it be disseminated in some other way, and in the academic medicine world, there aren't those vehicles to disseminate literature like that easily. So I would think that somehow, in a less formulated way than getting a book published, which is a journey in itself, as you said. You, you described it like giving birth, so for somebody who's given birth, you... It takes a lot longer. <laughs> right, right. And, and I'm thinking about Steve sitting next to you, thinking about Dr. Cantor, thinking about how to combine the world of academic medicine with those physician stories and those patient stories. And somehow. Um, well, I think that Rita Sharon's model at Columbia actually is something that we, we can emulate. Now, it's a very well-developed narrative medicine model, but they have, in addition to the many things they have, they, they often keep a parallel chart for patients. Right. She where the caregivers and, and can be involved in writing the things that don't go under a platelet count and LDH levels. And this may not get published, but this is the place to explore that. And that's often where, again, the meat of the issue is. A lot of oncology services have started this type of thing yeah. because of the, um, the strain on the caregivers. Um, I mean, the stories can become burdens after a while. You're taking in and taking in all these stories. At some point, we have to air them out. And it could be time set aside. So maybe instead of another QA meeting, we could have some meeting where you know, that time is given by the administration for this you know, in an informal way. And there's no outcome measure. There's no evaluation. There's no grade from 1 to 10. Just the experience of doing it. There are, um, <clears throat> there are techniques like that, balance groups you may right. be familiar yes. with, mm. that um, can do just what you're, you're saying. But someone has to make time for it and say it's important enough that we will right. give you a protected hour. Right. So, so let me pose another uh, question, which is uh, you talk about the difficulty establishing outcomes, but I think you described some outcomes. So if you know, students or residents we're able to write about a different type of patient story and bring that story to you, um, isn't that an outcome? Isn't that something that would not have happened previously? And when you question to yourself, looking at resident A, I wonder how well connected they are to the patient, and then have this set of descriptions that they've written in a portfolio or some other manner, can that help you evaluate or judge or assess that, boy, this guy really seems to get it, and I would not have anticipated that since all I heard before was patient admitted, denies this, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is an important point. I think what we can't do is give it a numerical ranking, that before they did this, they ranked three on the scale of empathy, now they rank seven on the scale of empathy. I think we'll never see that. 
But I think the idea of a portfolio of gathering these other bits of data that are less you know, quantitative is important than you can get a more of a gestalt view. Because in the end, when you choose your, you know, when you say who you're going to recommend as a doctor for your mother or mother-in-law, you know, it's not going to be the person with the most degrees on the wall. It's the physician for whom you have this great um, intuitive sense that this is a person I trust. And what makes that up is not going to be in their mortality rankings. I mean, obviously, and this is not to say that those don't matter. I mean, I'm, I'm making the assumption that clinical competence is the bare minimum and that we're working now above that level, that everyone has the competence that's done all that. I don't want to um, downgrade that. But then beyond that, what makes a really good doctor? It's like the definition of pornography. You know it when you see it, and you know it when it's not there. You know who are the doctors you would trust with your family member. And it's made up of these things that are difficult to measure, but a portfolio is one way that you could, you know, over time assess this. There was a study, and I think it was in the annals, that had students do, uh, residents do writing during each year of residency. And they ranked them, again, trying to be quantitative, in various emotional levels. And what there was was a huge dip in second year. And they were passionate that you know, interns are still new at it, and they're, they have some sort of excitement and, and optimism. Um, and third year, see the light at the end of the tunnel. But second year of res in the PGY2 year, you're just in the middle of that pit. And there's, you're so far from either shore. And it really is true. I think the PGY2 year is a sensitive year for depression and substance abuse and all these things that come up. And, and using this, these writings was one way of identifying this is a really vulnerable year. The, the, um so, so what you say, I think, is an excellent approach. The, uh, the difficulty that we all encounter is what if you want to uh, fail a student, to stop a student from graduating on the basis uh, that they're not able to write these kinds of things well. And, and that's the issue that all of us struggle with and that where more work needs to be done to understand. Uh, and, and so, of course, we retreat to more measurable kinds of things. Fred, you the microphone? Uh, as a palliative care physician, I can confess up front that my mortality rate is about 99.5%, about five out of 1,000. We, we get a little better than they came into the PCU. But uh, I, I want to ask something about professionals. I know that maybe that's another subject for another lecture, but uh, since uh, I think it, it is along the lines of some of the things we've talked about today. Uh, you published an article by, I think it was a resident named Judah Goldberg, about the potential conflict between professionalism and humanism mm -hmm. and focusing on the white coat ceremony is the thing that sort of makes us professional and he would fear different, I think too different from patients. And I'm just wondering what kind of feedback you got to that and also uh, if Dr. Ophrey has any comments on that. I think his, his concern was that making, uh, I mean, certainly there is something about professionalism, I think, that has to do with self-sacrifice, going the extra mile, uh, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and not making everything uh, uh, equate to dollars and cents, at least in our, our uh, reimbursement. But, uh, but I think his concern was that uh, it may also make, uh, you know, diminish our sense that we are human just like our patients and, and equal to them in that sense. And uh, I'm just interested in your comments. Um, yes, well, uh, we haven't received a lot of angry feedback on that one. Um, uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, article for the reasons you mentioned and, and uh, raised questions about what we're really doing with the, with the uh, white coat ceremonies. Um, I'm not sure I have, uh, go, go ahead. Well, I'll just make a comparison. Um, you know, a lot of medical journals now have literary sections, and they're probably the most popular. Most clinicians freely admit they see what the essay or poem is first, but the New England journals never wanted to do that. Bit. But they finally started in their perspectives to do some narrative. And um, one of the essays that's in my second book was the first one they published. Um, and it happened to be uh, about a Holocaust survivor and the experience of seeing her numbers. And I have to say, I got a lot of angry email letters on that, I mean, many positive ones, but many people said to the editors, dear sir, um, you know, how can you tug on the heartstrings? The idea that sort of being sentimental or pretty emotional um, was manipulative and that that ov overrode that. And I was surprised at how common a response uh, that was. And I think when we take these things into the f formal environment, there are many mixed reactions. Um, now, I haven't participated in these white coat ceremonies, and I guess because they seem, 
on the one side a little goofy, you know, the white coat, on the other hand, but I, it, it is marking time for, for that. And I think whenever we do this, we do open ourselves up to um, people's uncomfortable feelings. And I think that that identifies a very vulnerable area. When someone writes an angry letter, you've pushed some button, hopefully that, that's an effective thing to do. It's, um, I published another piece in the England Journal about a woman with a veil and my discomfort with the veil. And tons of angry responses, a lot from the Middle East about you know, stoking anti-Muslim um, feelings and how can you do that post 9-11 and really angry, angry letters. And I think that it just identifies that this is an area that people are very sensitive on and in fact it's the area that we need to go to. If we just talk about the politically correct stuff, it, nothing will happen, but it's airing that uncomfortable things that I think does bring the humanism and, and the professionals and we have to be on, honest about those mixed feelings. We will have our last question. Actually, it's less of a uh, question, it's more of a comment. And I just wanted to say kudos to the medical school and to you guys for coming on down because today everything is really controlled by dollars and cents. Um, and what we're talking about here today is not necessarily do dollars and cents, but really taking care of a patient. And when we're talking about education and making that the forefront, um, and when we're not talking about not research as scholarly activity, but education and patient care as scholarly activity, or taking our sentiment, our humanism, our professionalism, teaching eye contact and that three second interaction is not gonna be more reimbursable or less reimbursable, or educating our medical students from the clinical arena to the preclinical arena, if you will, it's not going to get more reimbursement today. And we know that the medical students and the residents usually follow the dollars. We also know that the HMOs will often control where those dollars go. And it's sort of nice, it is nice to see that it's not the HMO, the reimbursers, that are wagging where we are going over here. And if we're putting this as an inaugural lecture, saying this is where our values are, I think that's really great, and that it's not the tail wagging the dog. So I just want to say thank you. So with that, uh, I'd just like to read the last line of our, our, uh, our value of scholarship because I think that uh, we've uh, heard some terrific ways today to sort of tie that together, which says our students will learn how to inextricably link their scholarly work with their success as physicians. So with that, I'd like to thank both of our scholars, Dr. Steve Cantor and Dr. Danielle Ofri, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you.